Yeah, hi everyone. I often get the question how GPT models compare to Llama models, which are inarguably one of the most popular open weight models today. So I thought it might be worthwhile recording a short 15 minute video summarizing what has changed in these last six years since the release of GPT-1 back in 2018 till Llama 3.1 in July 2024. So of course, one of the things that has changed is the model size. Back in 2018, GPT-1 only had 124 million parameters. And then in 2019, when the researchers released GPT-2, we had already different model sizes ranging from 124 million to 1.5 billion uh, parameters. Then fast forwarding to 2023, Llama 1 had 7 billion to 65 billion, which is already a lot larger than GPT-2, for example. Then a few months later, Llama 2 was released in 2023, where the model size, let's say, increased only moderately. Uh, the largest model just got slightly bigger at 7 billion parameters. But there was a big leap in 2024 when the researchers released Llama 3, where Llama 3 now ranges from 8 billion to 405 billion, a much, uh, much um, bigger or significant increase in model size if we look at the largest model. Then data set wise, things also have changed quite a bit in these um, last years. So for example, in uh, 2019, the GPT-2 model had 40 billion training tokens. And in 2023, when we look at uh, Llama 1, the data set size was much bigger at 1.4 trillion tokens. 2023 was also the year, like I mentioned before, where Llama 2 was released. And here, the data set size only increased moderately to 2 trillion tokens. But again, there was a big leap with Llama 3, where we now have a 15 trillion token data set as a training data set. That's really gigantic. <laughs> but um, size is not everything. So a big focus in 2024 has been on the data set filtering. So if you look at recent research papers where the pre-training methodology is described, one of the recent focus areas has been on removing low quality data. So really actively de uh, developing methods, even other LLMs that can filter out low quality data. There was also an um, increased focus on enhancing the data mixing, which means actively exploring what makes a good data mix. For example, mixing different sources like books, internet um, sources and so forth, but then also focusing on general knowledge, math, science questions, code and so forth, and determining what a good mix is for the pre-training data set. Um, yeah, then also a lot of researchers have recently focused on synthesizing additional pre-training data in addition to what's currently, let's say, available in these um, existing data sets. And then also, interestingly, some researchers have experimented with including Q&A data, which is traditionally used for instruction fine-tuning, in the pre-training data set mix. But I would say one of the most significant or notable changes has been in the pre-training pipeline where before it was really just the same the same training loop and now it's more like a multi-stage procedure where the regular pre-training is followed by a long context pre-training which means essentially that the LLM is trained on a few rounds later on on large long inputs for example longer documents and then there's also high quality annealing stage where the researchers actively look for very, very high quality data and then use this very high quality data at the very end of the training to anneal the model, which is set to help with the model performance essentially. Yeah, and just to summarize how some of these recent um, pre-training protocols look like, I just made an overview here where I have Llama 3.1, Gwen 2 and Apple Foundation models, which are one of the, or three of the most, um, I would say recent and really capable models that have been um, shared in terms of the research papers. I think the Apple Foundation models are not available as open weights, but still that's a very good research paper describing the methodology. So you can see most of these models use most of these techniques I just described on the previous slide. However, I must say there's one big outlier and that is uh, Google's Gemma 2. So they don't really use many or most of these techniques. However, in my opinion, Gemma 2 is still a very, very good and capable model. So I use uh, Gemma 2 2 billion quite a lot because it's a nice 
small and convenient size for LLM and it works actually really well and um, I would say it's one of the best models also the Gemma 2 family even though they don't use all of these pre-training um, recipes or maybe it's just um, to my knowledge because I'm going here by the research papers it could be that they used some techniques that are not described in the paper. In any case, uh, just a brief, brief look at the fine-tuning. So fine-tuning has also changed a bit uh, recently in recent years when we look at these open weight models. For example, GPT-2, back then there was no instruction fine-tuning. Lama 1 also only came as a base model. But then when Lama 2 and Lama 3 were released, there were also instruction fine-tuned variants where for Lama 2, the researchers used um, instruction, supervised instruction fine-tuning followed by reinforcement learning with human feedback using the PPO algorithm. Then for Lama 3, they used instruction fine-tuning with a direct preference optimization pipeline, which is a bit simpler in terms of the algorithm, but they also included some other steps, including rejection sampling and so forth. So the pipeline got more complicated, the algorithm got a little bit simpler, I would say. But the main focus of this talk, this short, hopefully 15-minute talk, should be more on the architecture. I wanted to address the question how the architecture has changed over the years. So here is an overview of the 2018 GPT architecture, the original GPT architecture. And as you can see, there are a lot of building blocks here, a lot of blocks that make up this LLM. And yeah, you don't have to understand all the details here. I mainly want to show you how GPT looks like in comparison to other LLMs. So um, here is GPT-2, which is based on the same architecture as GPT-1, except now the researchers released this model in several sizes from 124 million to 1.5 billion parameters. And for the next slides, we will be specifically only looking at one of these models, and that is the XL model, which has 1.5 billion parameters, as I mentioned. So the difference really between the sizes is only the number of times certain elements are repeated. On the left-hand side, for example, how often the core transformer block is repeated. And on the right-hand side, how many attention heads this model has and what the embedding size is. So on the left-hand side, again, is this XL model that I just showed you. And if we compare this, for example, to Lama 17B, we can see there's really not that much that has changed. Of course, I highlighted a lot of things here. It looks a bit busy, but honestly, it's still the same architecture fundamentally. What has changed is actually quite interesting that the vocabulary size at the top got a bit smaller. Um, but then other things like... Uh, layer norm got replaced by RMS norm. That's really, I would say, personally an, a minor change. It's just a different way of normalizing the layer activations. Um, interestingly, they got rid of dropout. So dropout is not really needed for training anymore. And another change is on the right hand side, the GELU activation got replaced by the SILO activation function. But again, it's a small change. If you think back of classic deep learning, it's changing uh, ReLU with leaky ReLU or 10H activations, it's a minor change usually. And then at the bottom you can see that it's maybe the most notable change that the absolute positional embeddings in GPT got changed with ROPE embeddings, which stands for rotational positional embeddings. So this is just a, a different methodology of encoding positional information, but it's essentially also a relatively simple change in my opinion. Now. On the left-hand side um, is the same LAMA model I just showed you in the previous slide. If we compare this to LAMA 2 here, there's really not that much that has changed. As you can see, there's nothing really that is yeah, noticeable, except that the embedding size got increased from 2K to 4K. So it's like a small, well, actually at two times, but like a small change. And But a twice as much input is now supported, so you can have more tokens as input, which is quite useful in practice, but otherwise the same architecture. Um, coming from Lama 2 now, looking at Lama 3, what we can see here is yeah, two more changes. Um, so first, the embedding size got doubled again, so it's now 8,000 tokens. But the vocabulary size at the top, this one got much larger. We can see now we have four times the vocabulary. So yeah, this actually helps making the model much better because now the model doesn't need so many tokens to encode the same input. And it also helps with 
um, almost uh, I would say everything else. So it helps with performance, with computational efficiency, and so forth. And uh, another trick here that they use to improve computational efficiency is replacing the masked multi-head attention in the center with grouped query attention. So I must say, uh, for a disclaimer, this was also already used by the larger LAMA2 models, for example, the 34 billion and 70 billion models, but this is new in the smallest LAMA3 model or la smallest uh, LAMA model in, in general. So what is grouped query attention? It's essentially a computational trick to reduce the number of trainable parameters. So on the left-hand side, for example, we have regular multi-head attention. And yeah, it's a short 15-minute talk, so I won't go over the details of how multi-head attention works. But the idea is that for each query, we have a key value pair. Whereas on the right-hand side, in grouped query attention, a query or two queries share the same key and value pair. So we keep reusing some of the key value um, pairs. So in that sense, we have fewer parameters in this uh, multi-head attention module. So here, for example, we share for e uh, query and value for each two, sorry, we share the key and value for each two queries, which means that we have two times fewer keys and values in this masked multi-head attention module, which yeah, reduces the parameter size by a lot in, in that module. And yeah, um, so, so far the takeaway I would say is that modern architectures like LAMA are still mostly derived from GPT and are very similar to GPT. And that allows us, for example, to implement yeah, convenient code libraries that keep reusing the same code for uh, different LLMs to make a nice, readable and compact um, LLM library. So one of these libraries um, I helped developing at Lightning AI is called LitGPT. And in LitGPT, we have this GPT class here, where GPT class uh, is just like a Python class that is used to implement various different LLMs. Just to show you, for example, we can accept a dictionary here with um, settings for a LAMA3 model. And yeah, you can see there are a few numbers, but what I wanted to show you is that we can reuse all the code um, in this file for different LLMs. For example, here, LAMA3, or Microsoft's Phi. And you can see just a few numbers changed here, but it's fundamentally still a dictionary that we can pass in, and there are not that many changes between Llama and Phi 3, for example. Or there is Mixtral, yet another LLM that is quite popular, and uh, Mixtral is uh, actually quite interesting. So there is another change I wanted to mention that is, I would say, not the most frequently used architecture design, but it's one of the new things since GPT-1 was released. And that is um, the so-called mixture of experts module or sometimes abbreviated as MOE. So what is mixture of experts? So here on the left-hand side, just the base architecture, the Llama architecture. And in the mixture of experts module, what we do is we go into this feed forward or multi-layer perceptron part and we replace that with multiple uh, feed-forward layers, essentially. And there's a router, and the router here routes the input to one or more of these blocks. So in a sense, mixture of experts makes the model larger by adding multiple feed-forward modules instead of just one. So in the case of Mixtral, we have now eight feed-forward blocks. However, only two are active or utilized at a time, which essentially means we make the model much larger. Let's say from Lama um, 3, from 8 billion, we go to 47 billion here in mixed role. But since only two experts are active at a time, this means that only 13 billion parameters are used at a time. So it's still larger than Lama because two experts or two feed forward modules are used at the same time but it's still not as big as um, if all the feed-forward modules would be used at the same time. So it's one way to kind of increase the model size, but then also still make it relatively efficient. So it's yeah, one of the architecture changes in recent years, but not many models use that. One example is Mixtral, and the other example that comes to mind is the successor of Olmo, which is called um, All MOE, basically, which came out a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, there's uh, another example here, Gemma 2. I picked this example because there's yet another 
architecture difference. It's not invented by Gemma 2, but it's one of the models that uses this. And this is called sliding window attention. And this is uh, yet another way of improving computational efficiency without harming the modeling performance necessarily that much. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the regular um, causal attention mechanism that is used in GPT and Llama. And um, so what this method does is essentially for each given position in the input, it pays attention to all the other tokens in the input. So it's just a classic, um, the classic setup. So here what, what's notable is that it pays attention to itself and all the tokens that come before it, but not the future tokens. That's why it's called causal attention. That's why you have this um, diagonal here. So the one here means it's paying attention to this token and zero means it does not pay attention. In citing window attention, the yeah, I would say the difference is that we restrict the window, the context window further. So for a given input token, we only look at the uh, immediate proximity of other tokens. We don't look at all the tokens in the past. And so what it does, it's, it's reducing the computational burden on this com uh, attention mechanism because attention is uh, scales quadratically with the input size. So if the input size is n, the computational complexity here is n squared because it's for each token it uh, pays attention to each other token in the past. So at the last position it's paying attention to all the other tokens. Here it's limited to how many tokens our window size is essentially. So it's yet another computational trick to make LLMs computationally more efficient without necessarily sacrificing too much modeling performance. So according to benchmarks, the modeling performance is almost the same as with um, regular um, full causal self-attention. Yeah, so in any case, uh, just wanted to summarize all the recent areas of focus in the development and progress uh, when it comes to transformer-based LLM development. So for instance, um, the model size is one of these components. However, with the exception of LAMA 3.1, 405B, I would say the focus is still pretty much on developing 7 billion parameter models. So the size really, I would say, is quite stable over the years that most of the progress in terms of model performance doesn't come necessarily from the size, but more from other things. So. Since GPT, there has been a lot of focus on adding a few tweaks to make to make models more efficient. For example, like I mentioned, um, group query attention, mixture of experts, and sliding window attention. But then a lot of the attention, no pun intended, has been spent on post-training recipes, really refining the instruction fine-tuning process and then developing these uh, multi-round RLHF and PPO and DPO um, procedures. I haven't talked about it that much in this talk because the focus was more on the architecture, but a lot of focus also goes into developing post-training recipes. But overall, I would say the biggest focus has been also, uh, in terms of time and money, spent being spent on the pre-training recipes, you know, like larger data sets, but then also uh, filtering, synthetic data, multi-stage pre-training, and so forth that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So relative to each other, I think most of the cost and effort is spent on the pre-training recipes, followed by the post-training, and then yeah, tweaking the architecture a bit, but not deviating too much from the GPT. And then also, yeah, the model size, I would say for most open source models is around 7B, which is a convenient size. So, yeah, if you are interested in, I would say, truly understanding LLMs, one of the best ways is really building one. So I have a new book where I build a model from scratch, from the ground up. This includes implementing the data input pipeline to instruction fine-tuning. So that might be something you might find useful in your journey if you really want to understand how LLMs are built, how they are implemented. And then, yeah, also if you're interested, our LitGPT library that I helped developing at Lightning AI, it's an open source library where we develop, yeah, or implement different LLMs in the same lean and efficient code base, which I think is also a great way to learn how LLMs differ. And so, yeah, you might find that interesting as well, maybe as a follow-up to the book, where the book only focuses on one LLM, and here it's bringing different LLMs into the same code base. So, yeah, and anyway, I hope you uh, liked this short 15-minute video. I hope it's really just a um, short 15 minutes because I didn't have a stopwatch. And, yeah, thanks for watching, and until next time.